he um, is that we are right here. Yep, I think so. I think it's just recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> he is at Orono um, and has been involved with turtles and all other of the amphibian creatures for a long time, I believe. Um, he even has some friends here with him. So I'm not going to take up any more of his time. That. Oh, I need to turn that off then, right? Okay, can everybody hear me? Um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you to the rest of the main audience about very much to talk to you about a topic that I, of course, absolutely love. I spend way too much time on turtles, thinking about turtles, doing things with turtles, and things to turtles. Um, I spend a lot of time dealing with turtles. It's a fun opportunity to talk even more about turtles. So I didn't really know what to, to title this talk, exactly what to put in a talk about turtles, because there's so much to talk about. So forgive me, I put everything in. So I apologize for that. I talk, I talk a little bit about a lot of things. So, um, there's a lot to come up. We're going to cover a little bit of a lot of different things. And I want to leave at the end is I do happen to have questions or throw some ideas you want to talk about it afterwards. Um, I, I kind of leave time for that as well. So um, there, there is an also, there is absolutely a lot to talk about. So I want to start actually all the way back. Excuse me. Um, some of the Zoom tests are saying you sound like you're underwater, so you may need to stand closer to the microphone. Oh, okay. He has the microphone. Yeah. 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 Let me ask them. Matt, we're having trouble with the Zoom people not hearing you. And I don't know whether if you turn on the microphone that I used or whether you can turn your, can you turn the yours up for the Zoom? Is, the, is that microphone there on? Okay, that one may need to be on. Let me ask them. Keep, keep, keep talking and we'll see what they say. It's still very garbled. mute myself on Zoom. That's good. Huh. But now this is I'm gonna stop share and then reshare and see if now they said they can hear you great. Oh uh, okay. So we did something that worked well. Huh? Okay, let me try doing this again here. There we go. Okay. Um, so I think we're good with sound and visuals, right? Okay. Awesome. So, oh, okay. How we had it there. Um, Got to escape. 
Ah, okay. Okay. There yes. we go. Okay, are we good now? Probably. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> um, so I'll I'll resume. So um so dinosaur, I'm sorry, turtles first evolved around the same time as the dinosaurs. They gotta get back in the mindset. Um, about 230 million years ago, it turns out that in the last decade we've learned a lot from the fossil record and Turtles are, in fact, more closely related to lizards and snakes, and two uh, extant groups, that are species that are still with us today. And we know that from fossils like uh, Eorhynchochelys right here, you can see the expanded ribs just starting to get enlarged, which actually will later form through evolutionary time, the, the, um, uh, the turtle shell. So they pretty much seal the, the deal, and we, now we know where they're out, uh, the, um, where uh, turtles essentially arose from evolutionarily. These are from uh, fossils uh, dating from about 230 million years ago from China. Uh, slightly more recently, we have animals that are starting to look more and more like turtles. These would be similar to like a soft shell turtle today where we have an incomplete formation of, um, of the top part of the shell, reduced sort of bottom part of the shell, but definitely looking more and more turtle-like. Adontochelys are known from fossils around 200 to 210 million years ago. And then at around the same time, we're getting animals that look a lot like modern day turtles. There's some key differences in morphology, especially around uh, the beak morphology and, and the cranial structure, so it's the skull. But yet now we have structures like Proganochelys that look a lot like modern day turtles. And these are dating from around 200 million years ago. Um, so turtles have been with us a long time and this body design of having this, this armor, this shell has been extraordinarily successful. Not extremely specious, there's not tons of species richness out there, but there are quite a few. Um, they beat the dinosaurs. They evolved about the same time, and yet they've outlived the dinosaurs. Um, in fact, turtles have, have um, withstood the test of time and survived through not one, but two different mass extinction events. Oh. Recommendations? How should I do this? Stop share and then reshare? Oh, so they're not in, in, advancing. Mm. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. How do we get the uh, this stuff off of here? Hide floating meeting controls, but then I, I want to. Mm. Can I get rid of this off of there too? What? You get it? I'm on it now. The, the guy, I mean, it looks like it's a, a really nice presentation, but. Um, but I don't think I want to duplicate the screen because I don't want to. Whoever's running the meeting is having some tech issues, so it could very okay. well be why I couldn't get on. Oops. I think I'm making it worse. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. And then I'll just tuck this down here. What's with the orange rectangle? Oh, it's fading. <laughs> Whoops, it's fading back. <laughs> Is it going to fade away again? Please move this window away from the shared. What does that mean? Okay, it's fading away. <laughs> Whoops, it's fading back again. <laughs> huh. 
escape. Let me try to stop sharing. So, but I, let's see if it works. <laughs> there are so many so parallels. Yeah. 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 No, this is not working. Again. Suffice you the shot of it, but you're seeing inside the cockpit as it's going through the cockpit. And then you like pan back to the cutie and then you go back to the cockpit. Yeah. You have to enter the intro. Do you remember the best picture for the first ever again? You have to. Okay. But then if I. Can the folks on Zoom see it? It's not. Well, it's like this is. I don't think that's going to solve the problem, though. I, I sent a note to Tim just in case he can. Okay, then I will say they can see the slides. Okay, good. Okay, so I can just use the arrow key. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I think we should just go ahead and do the arrow key. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay. So uh, turtles have survived not one, but two mass extinctions. One about 200 million years ago, the end Cretaceous, and then they also survived the same uh, mass extinction event that did in the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. So in many respects, turtles are more successful than dinosaurs, which I think just adds to their mistake and um, kind of how awesome that they, they really are. So turtles have withstood a lot over evolutionary time and they're still with us today, but They've also permeated sort of our cultures, our traditions, our folklore, our stories. They permeated Hollywood. Um, they really are, have a presence in sort of modern day cultures across the world. Um, when I was in um, Asia a few years ago in a Buddhist temple, um, they have sort of pits like this on the side of um, sort of the main hall. These are designed for turtles. Turtles are seen as a sign of prosperity. They're, uh, they're seen as being lucky, a sign of good fortune. Um, and they like to keep turtles, which is, unfortunate for the turtles themselves because very few different, very few turtle species are doing well in the wild and the vast majority of the time they are collected from the wild. Um, but yet it does show some reverence for, uh, for having turtles around and, and, and for them as a group. Better to use trinkets and items like that rather than live turtles. Of course, this is slowly catching on, but probably not fast enough. And really, I mean, what we want to do is avoid, um, avoid living turtles altogether. So if you get an opportunity, you can always get like a little turtle dessert. These are made out of uh, out of uh, glutinous rice. Um, so turtles have a presence, was my point, in, in lots of different cultures, in lots of different capacities, lots of different ways. Um, those are Asian cultures and Western culture, of course. Um, there's lots of examples as well. Native American cultures are rife with, um, with um, uh, sort of examples of turtles in, in folklore and mythology, creation myths. It's thought that turtles, the backs of turtles form islands into themselves. And there are many creation stories that are almost ubiquitous across different Native American cultures, um, having given rise to, um, well, to all other species. Um, we see some, a lot of um, sort of more recent examples of how turtles have, have come into their own in, in Western tradition. So of course, Aesop's fables, the turtle, the tortoise and the hare, um, a little bit later in time, if you read Dr. Seuss as a kid, Yertle the Turtle uh, was, a, was a favorite of a great many people. And if you're yeah, younger yet, you probably know the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, the pizza-loving martial arts practicing teenage uh, mutant turtles. Um, so turtles have really um, permeated our culture and, uh, and play a, um, uh, an important role in our society in lots of different respects, from Hollywood to literature to folklore to, to tradition. So all of that is to say that we care about turtles as a people, right? The human race, and that's important. And we should not lose sight of that given the conservation concern that turtles are facing today. I intentionally didn't want to talk a lot about conservation, but I think I'm going to slip in a few things here and there because it is an important message um, with, respect to, uh, with respect to turtles. So um, let, me ask, let me ask you a question. How many turtle species do you think there are on Earth today? So not, his, not prehistorically, not going back to the time of the dinosaurs today. How many, how much? 275 species, okay, globally speaking. Any other guesstimates? Anybody want to hazard a guess? 
400. Okay. Um, but I do think the different standards give you different experiences. 50. Okay. So, what, what so range is 50 uh, to 400. And, um, this was I think it's thousands. Those are there are thousands, yeah. about 10,000 species of birds. Um, well, actually, this is made out of it. Yeah. 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 Um, there's, as reptiles as a whole, there's about 10,000. There's roughly 10,000 amphibians as well. Turtles are not that speciose of a group. 100 million years ago, there were a lot more species that, than there are today, but there's about 356 as of a few months ago. Now, this number changes, right? You guys are actually pretty close. I'm impressed. Um, better than my herpetology students. So that's that's great. Um, but this 356 species represents an extraordinary 230 million years worth of evolution. So the amount of diversity housed in these few hundred species is, is really outstanding. So we have groups um, that are known as the Pleurodires, the side neck turtles in the Southern hemisphere, right? A very large group. All of the turtles that you're familiar with, they're very likely familiar with, those from North America are the Cryptodires. Um, these are all examples of Cryptodires right here. You might recognize the giant leatherback. This is the heaviest turtle on earth. The shell alone is about six feet long. They can weigh up to 2,000 pounds. This is a Galapagos tortoise. They can live to be 177 years old and counting. Right? Extraordinary diversity. This little diminutive turtle here is the Vallarta mud, mud turtle from Mexico. At, at an adult size, its shell is only a few inches long. It is a tiny, tiny animal compared to critters like these guys right here. So the amount of diversity housed in those 356 species is really extraordinary. How is that diversity distributed over the surface of the earth? This is a review done a few years ago, but it shows the turtle hotspot. So this is um, the redder the color, sort of the warmer the color, the greater the species richness in that particular area. And you can see that the Eastern United States, especially the Southeastern US is extraordinarily speciose. It's very species rich. In fact, we're second only to parts of Asia in terms of the number of species that we have here in the Eastern United States, which is, I think, quite a claim to fame. Give it a few more years, we might have more species, given the extinction rates here are astronomically high right now, which is sad, but true. So a little bit about turtle diversity. I said we're going to cover a lot. Now I'm moving on. So let's talk about turtle morphology. Let me give you some language to use as we talk um, to get you familiar with them. Um, uh, with how biologists describe turtles and, and, and work with turtles. So when you have a turtle like this, this is a wood turtle right here, actually the same species that's pictured um, on the slide. The top half of the shell is called the carapace. You turn it over, the bottom half of the shell is called the, the plastron. So we have the carapace and we have the plastron. Each of these carotenized scoots, so these are basically keratin-rich skin in form of plates. These are sitting on top of the bone. Each of these, each of these sort of plates right here is called a scoop. And there's lots of scoots that are usually arranged, arranged in rows. Now, the, of course, this is true for, uh, for most species of turtles, but not, for example, like that leatherback that I showed you a minute ago, or softshell turtles, if you're familiar with those. Um, now, scoots can come in sort of different forms. If you're a wood turtle, again, like pictured right here, they add a little ring every year, kind of like the rings on a tree. As they grow, they add a ring and they get bigger and bigger. We call those annuli. Each annulus is up in these temperate areas represents about one year of growth. It's a good way of aging turtles up to a certain age. However, not all turtles have uh, scoots that grow like this. Um, if you're a painted turtle, your scoots are what's called deciduous. So this is a painted turtle shell. Des deciduous scoots simply means that they shed them. And so they'll peel off um, not necessarily every year, but fairly regularly to keep to keep that uh, uh, shell sort of smooth and clean um, and um, yeah, smooth and clean. So this is a turtle right here that's shedding some scoots. It's a painted turtle, just like the uh, the slide that I showed you a moment ago. So um, in chatting with kids, I I, I often um, I don't see any any kids in here, but um, I often hear well. Can you take a turtle out of a shell? You know, it's kind of an interesting question. You should absolutely never try that. That would be terrible for the turtle because the turtle is the shell, right? Um, so it, it's, it seems sort of counterintuitive at first because it's like the turtle living inside of its home, but the turtle is both simultaneously itself and its home. And so this is a, a picture of a turtle with a class run. Again, that lower part of the shell removed. And you can see that the um, ribs have fused with the vertebral column, and those ribs have also 
uh, flattened and expanded and fused with one another, thus forming the shell. So you can't remove a turtle from the shell any more than you could remove a person from its vertebral column. Right? It's just not possible. It is, it, the animal is its shell. Um, I also get lots of questions about, well, how do you tell males from females with turtles? Um, and that's a great question. It actually is a very taxon specific thing. That is some turtles you tell one way and some another way. So let me give you a couple of examples. So pictured right here, these are painted turtles. We have a male on the left. And we know that because its tail is much longer, it's wider at the base and it's cloaca, which is that um, uh, sort of single hole that's used both for reproduction and waste excretion. When that tail is gently pulled out, it extends beyond the margin of the carapace. Again, that's the top part of the shell. The females do not, right? And that's one easy way to tell a male from a female turtle if you have it in hand and if it's not too bitey um, for most species of turtles. Sometimes it's very hard if the animals are big, if you can't readily handle them, if it's like a wood turtle where they have very powerful muscular tails, you can't just gently pull the tail out. So another way of doing that is by turning the animal over and looking at the plastron. Again, that's the bottom part of the shell. If it's indented like this, it's a male. If it's flat on the bottom, it's a female. So concave male, flat female. Easy way to tell for a lot of species of turtles, especially those that have um, that live on land at least part of the year or have very high dome shells. Why is that? Why does it make sense for males to have a concave plastron and females to have a flat plastron? I mean, really, it's, it, it's all mechanical. It's to avoid awkward situations like this. Um, during mating, it just makes sense if the male can rest easily on top of the female and not slide or roll off. These are box turtles. They have domed uh, plastrons and, and very, very, um, or concave plastrons and very domed shells. Yep. So, what I thought I would do now is dive into the turtles of Maine um, and give you a sense of the turtle species that might be living in your own backyard or that you might see on a camping trip or a paddling trip. Um, so these are the, are the species that we're likely to see in our, in our great state. Of Maine. So you might be familiar with this critter right here. Who has seen a snapping turtle like within the last couple of years? It's yeah, lots of you. I, I I'm not surprised. It's probably our most it's probably our most common turtle. It's not the most commonly seen turtle, but it's very likely our most common turtle here in Maine. It's also our largest turtle. So these are animals that can get to be about 40 pounds, although that's a rare animal indeed. Mo more commonly an adult would be somewhere between really about 10 to 20 pounds. The males in this species are larger than females. Not true for a lot of species of turtles, but for snapping turtles, the males do tend to be larger. The maximum size um, being our largest turtle in Maine is quite large and their shells can be about 18 inches or so long maximum size. So quite a hefty animal indeed. Pictured here are some representatives um, of, of what the, this uh, sort of sub-adults and adults might look like. So when they're what, younger, you might see sort of three bumpy ridges down the, the carapace, again, the top part of the shell. Um, that's a good sign that you're looking at a snapping turtle. Although in older animals, very large animals, they tend to wear smooth and it can be hard to tell. If you can see its tail, its tail has sort of like dinosaur ridges down the back, right? It's our only turtle that has that feature. So if you can get a good look at its tail and you see that it has um, uh, those bumps down the, down the back of its tail, right? Those little sail fins, and you know it's a snapping turtle. It's also one of those turtles that can't easily withdraw its head all the way into its shell, right? Especially when they're younger. A lot of our turtles can, but this one can't do that very well. Some other things that are important to note, since we have a nice big picture of a snapping turtle head right here, note that turtles don't have teeth, right? In fact, no turtle has teeth, no extant turtle. that is not extinct turtle has teeth. Um, but what they do have is a carotenized bill, a, a carotenized beak. So it's like a sheath over um, over the bone forming its beak. And those carotenized sheaths can be very, very sharp. So especially important when talking about some critters like this one right here. Um, so I said that no turtle actually has teeth. That's true. However, there are some species that have something that's secondarily evolved, right? So they lost teeth, but it turns out that Teeth are actually really useful in certain some circumstances. So they re-evolved something that 
function like tea. So if we look at like, say, a green turtle, a green sea turtle, which many of you might be familiar with, they're largely vegetarian. They graze eel grass and other types of aquatic uh, marine vegetation species. And so in order to eat those and be able to, to uh, rip them off um, uh, prior to eating, they have a serrated bill, right? And so they're uh, serrated beak. And so essentially they have like little tiny steak knives um, functioning much like teeth, although they're not true teeth like mammals have. So these are all adults right here. Um, snapping turtles are also interesting because they have, and this might be probably related to the fact that they are so populous in the state um, in over much of their range in the Eastern United States. They go all the way down to Southern Florida, all the way up into Canada, across the Eastern seaboard. Um, they're, they're very fecund as well. So clutch sizes for, uh, Easter, for uh, Eastern snapping turtles can be right around 30 eggs per clutch, which is, which is quite high compared to most turtles anyway. Interestingly, despite the fact that it's so large, they hatch out, they're about the same size as most other main turtles. In other words, they're about the size of a half dollar or a silver dollar. So pictured here are a whole bunch of a sort of young of the year. Um, this one right here, um, there's another, another baby right here, but this one right here is one that I hatched out a few years ago from some eggs that were um, about to be destroyed. Relatively easy to hatch in captivity. But see right here, I think I have it. There we go. Right there, that little tiny white dot. Can you see that? Any ideas what that is? Does anybody hatch chickens? Yeah, it's an egg tooth. Yeah, in turtles, we call them caruncles. It's an egg tooth, so just like birds have. So it's a little tiny protrusion. It's carotidous. It's absorbed after just maybe a week or so. If you see a hatchling or a young of the year with that egg tooth, um, you know that it, it hatched very, very recently. They use that to tear the egg, those leathery shells, to tear the egg um, upon hatching. Um, like this little, little critter right here. So the eastern snapping turtles are also very interesting because um, if, if you've ever been to a turtle frog, and I kind of hope you haven't, fortunately, they're not as popular as they used to be, but you know, my grandfather grew up on a farm and used to have turtle fries, unfortunately. Um, but it's the snapping turtles that commonly form um, the, the diet of, of, um, of turtle fries for, for people. So this was taken in um, uh, central Maine, I think near Burnham. Um, and this is essentially the shell of a, of a turtle. And if you look right here, this is one reason why they're so sad, because of course you often find snapping turtles, like many other species of turtles, when they're crossing the road, they're often crossing the road to lay eggs, so they're about to deposit the eggs, which is, which is pretty sad. But what you can also see here is that these eggs are round. This is the only species of turtle in Maine that has round eggs. So if you see clutch with lots of eggs and they're all round, you know it's one of these guys. So that was the eastern snapping turtle. I want to also talk about um, next, the eastern musk turtle. So we're actually going from the largest down to what might be the smallest turtle in Maine. So these guys are diminutive little creatures. This is an eastern musk turtle shell. This is from an adult. You can see they're pretty tiny. They'll get to be a little bit bigger than this, but but not very much. Um, these guys are... are um, are called musk turtles, their scientific name, Ternothus odoratus. You might have heard of them because they also go by the name stink pot. These are smelly creatures, right? <laughs> right along the bridge. The bridge is the part of the shell that connects the plaster onto the carapace. It's that little piece right there. They have a gland called a Rathke's gland, and that gland secretes a musk-like substance. It's this pungent oil, um, and it does, it does smell rather musky. It is rather smelly. I'm so stink pots, turn off there's odorot, it's must turtle, they're after the name. Yeah. That's for defense. Yeah. Yep. Um, so they, they tend to release the scent when they're uh, perturbed and they're aggravated, which they often are when you pick them up. They're feisty little creatures. So um, some other very interesting things about, about musk turtles that we can sex them in order to determine the males from females a little bit differently than other species. So pictured right here is a male. We know it's a male. Well, one, it does have a very large tail. You guys know that now. But also, um, it has a lot of space here between these plastral scoops. The skin here is very wide. That's indicative of males in this species. But really only this group, right? This is a different family 
than the snapping turtle that I showed you a moment ago. Um, but it does work well to determine males from females for this particular species. Eastern musk turtles, like snapping turtles, uh, live in a variety of habitats, but they really like the very slow moving water or still water. They like it when it's sort of dark and mucky. In fact, like snapping turtles, they'll often get abundant algae on their carapaces. Um, it's, um, yeah, it makes them even harder, harder to spot because they're ambush hunters. So they'll be hunkered down in that muck. Um, and if they're covered with algae, they're already dark colored, they can be quite hard to see. But they do like these habitats. They rely on these habitats, in fact, and they have adaptations for these habitats. So you can kind of make it out of this picture right here, but there's two little, two little fleshy protuberances. Those are called barbels. And they use that to sense the environment around them, not unlike your cat's whiskers, right? So that as they're maneuvering around in these, in these mucky, uh, marshy waters, it's very dark, it's very dim, it's hard to see. They use those barbels to sense the environment around them. So again, very feisty animals, um, but but relatively harmless. Um, actually, I would say all turtles in Maine are relatively harmless, even the snapping turtle, but these ones, because of their diminutive size, maybe especially so. So we talked about snapping turtles. We talked about musk turtles. They're two different families of turtles. We have one representative of each. All of the rest of the turtles that we have here in Maine, at least the freshwater turtles, are all of a different family. The first one that I want to talk to you about in this other family, the family of Mydidae, are the painted turtles. Now, I said that the uh, snapping turtles are probably our most common turtle. It's hard to know that for sure. But the most commonly seen turtle is probably the painted turtle. And that's because painted turtles, they love to bask. They're the ones that are out on the logs in that farm pond, right, or in that lake margin sometimes on the bank, but often on logs where they can dive into the water very quickly. If you've been paddling in areas and all the turtles suddenly jump in the water, right, you probably just caught a glimpse of the behind of a painted turtle. Um, very, very common. Um, and despite, they kind of like cardinals in that sense. I think if they were rare, we'd probably appreciate them more, right? They're just so beautiful with their colors. Probably one of the most colorful turtles on earth. Um, so this is a, a, a nice looking animal right here. And you can see it's pretty typical. It's got the yellow um, on the face and stripes. And then it has these red uh, uh, sort of marginal scoots. Those would be the scoots around the outside of the carapace. If you were to flip one over, you see that um, the bottom is totally immaculate, kind of like that, that uniform yellow color. It's interesting because here in Maine, we actually have two different subspecies. So we have this one pictured right here over most of Maine, and then we get a little bit of sort of gene flow or, or genetics from other neighboring states of a different subspecies. So sometimes you see them with black blotches on the bottom. You can kind of see it um, on this shell right here, but sometimes you do get a little bit of pigment um, on the bottom. So in keeping with this idea of how we tell differences between males and females of turtles, it really is species specific. So pictured here is a male and a female. They look pretty similar overall. But snapping turtles, the females were smaller. In painted turtles, the females are larger. That's one way to tell. Although a small female and a big male might be pretty similar, but interestingly, strangely, you can look at the length of the nails. Um, why is that? Well, the males have longer wolverine-like nails. And that's because during courtship, the males will go in front of the female, which is all underwater. They'll swim in front of the female. They'll get up like right to her face. So they're like almost nose to nose, right? And he'll sit there and he'll take his front feet, his forelimbs, and he'll put himself, position himself in front of her and he wiggles his nails like this, <laughs> almost like tickling her cheeks. Um, it's, it's, it's comical to watch. Um, but that's their, that's their courtship display. So the male needs long nails to do this. So hence, sexually mature males, um, happens at around a few years of age, or about five years of age for a turtles. They have very long overly white claws compared to the females. So if you get an animal and you're not sure, but you're able to get a really good look and you see it looks like this, what would you say, male or female? Male. And then what about this one? Female. Yeah. So it works pretty well if we're talking about a subadult or adult painted turtle. <clears throat> so the next turtle that I want to talk about is one that you're unlikely to see because it is threatened in the state of Maine. It also, its geographic distribution doesn't go beyond Maine. 
It only goes about halfway up the state. They're quite rare. The state is very interested in sightings of these turtles, in fact, because there's just not very many of them. They're also habitat specialists. They like these bog environments. Sometimes they'll use vernal pools and surrounding wetlands, but their core habitat really consists of these sphagnum bog, these sphagnum bogs. So this, of course, is the spotted turtle, Clemmys gratata. They are beautiful. They're also in the pet trade. They're heavily overcollected. They're traded uh, both domestically and overseas, which is causing declines in many areas. So there's a lot of concern about, about spotted turtle populations. If musk turtles aren't our smallest species, and I suspect that they are, it might be this guy, right? These spotted turtles are tiny, only about this big as adults. So pictured right here is a, uh, is a pretty big female. Um, you can see fairly smooth shell. They actually do have annuli. They have non-deciduous scutes. Now you know what that means. You can see it a little bit better on this plastron. You can see the annuli, those little growth rings uh, fairly clearly. Also very pigmented uh, uh, plastron. Now, a lot different than the, the painted turtle. These species are sometimes sometimes mixed up with one another, painted turtles and spotted turtles, because they both tend to be so colorful. One is very, very common, the painted turtle. One is quite rare in the state. That would be the spotted turtle. Even as youngsters, though, they have spots, and they are rather adorable. Let's say. So this is a, a young of the year right here, probably born. Um, this was taken a little bit later in the year, probably born earlier that year, or rather, I'm sorry, the, the following fall, the previous fall, um, and um, yeah, so this would be less than one year old. So the next turtle that I want to talk about is the Blanding's turtle, Amadoidea blanding. I again, we're in the same family, Amidae. These are the so-called pond turtles. Uh, there's a lot of species. It's the most uh, species-rich family here in the United States. So we thought the spotted turtle was really uncommon. I mean, it turns out that the Blanding's turtle is even more uncommon. It is listed as endangered by the state, which is one more level of classification of rareness. Now, part of that is because, well, they're, they, they're kind of habitat specialists. There's just not very many of them even where they are. But we are, like the spotted turtle, right at the northern edge of the geographic distribution of this species. They go pretty far south, all the way out to the Midwest. They just barely make it into Maine by a county or two, right? So they were never very abundant. But we know what's really interesting is that there's a disjunct population in Nova Scotia that appears to be natural. So at one point, they were probably more widespread, possibly extending along the whole coast of Maine. We're not really sure, but all we know is right now, they're just in that sort of York County area of Maine, just barely into the state. And then there's another disjunct population way over in Nova Scotia. So Blanding's turtles, um, it's a larger turtle than the spotted turtle. Um, there are many similarities between the two. They are actually not that distantly related to one another, same subfamily, different, uh, different genus. They're much larger though. They're probably about, well, about that big. Um, they have a very high domed shell, although they are quite aquatic, which is interesting. Usually you tend to find aquatic turtles with flatter shells because it makes them more hydrodynamic when they're swimming. Not true for, uh, for Blanding's turtles, possibly because they, they prefer smaller water bodies. They prefer water bodies without moving water, and they do quite well in those habitats. They often have a very speckled appearance. So whereas spotted turtles have distinct spots, painted turtles, you might recall, sort of had a, a line pattern on their carapace, Blanding's turtles have more like um, a freckling, more like a constellation of sorts on their uh, uh, carapace. Really old individuals, like many other species of reptiles, they do tend to lose that pigmentation and they tend to be more uniformly dark in color. We see that pretty regularly um, in reptiles. Probably the single most distinguishing feature of Blanding's turtles is that banana yellow throat. And their neck is quite long. And when they put that neck out, I have some, I guess they're not out very far here, but when they extend their neck, you can see it's all sort of that banana yellow color. And that's diagnostic for this species. Um, I'm gonna go back a slide here. They also have a, a diagnostic um, rather comical perpetual smile. So that's another way. If you're staring at one in the face up close, you can ID the species that way as well. Um, so quite a handsome turtle also in the pet trade. Uh, probably because of its size and habitat requirements, not quite as common as some of the other species, but still overcollected for the pet trade as well. 
Yeah, the next species that I want to tell you about um, is my personal favorite. That's the wood turtle, Leptemis and Sculpta. It's my favorite because I've spent um, almost 10 years now studying this, this turtle, largely in just a, a couple of populations. I got to know these animals very, very well. This animal right here was a large male wood turtle uh, that passed away in our, on our study site. Um, incidentally, his name was Cutie. He was a nice looking turtle. Um, he was also known as, uh, I think it was 7223, um, was his official, that was his official name. That was not what the crew called him, but, um, but the wood turtle is a beautiful animal. Um, it has that, um, the, the, the uh, sorry, non-deciduous scoot, so they, they have those annualized growth rings. Um, so the, it gives the, uh, their uh, individual scoots almost a pyramidal shape to them, which makes them quite, quite handsome um, as, uh, uh, as a turtle. Um, their plastron, again, the underside of the shell has unique patterns, uh, like pictured here. This is pretty typical. These patterns are unique, kind of like fingerprints to individuals. Um, and so we, like the, the state, has a large monitoring program named Inland Fisheries and Wildlife for wood turtles. And they also take plastron photos like we do, and they use that as a form of identification. Um, so if you find another turtle later, you can compare it against your uh, your photo collection from all of your animals, and that will help you ID that animal at a future date. And this, I can tell you, is, is very helpful. Um, you can see that sort of that burnt orange color, that's diagnostic for, uh, for New England wood turtles. Um, wood turtles are, are also interesting. Well, they're interesting for lots of reasons. I'll get into that a little bit here. Um, but the, there's a Midwestern sort of population and a New Englander, uh, more Eastern population. Eastern ones tend to look like this with a beautiful pumpkin orange color, um, that sort of banana yellow plastron, very similar to the Midwestern populations. But in the Midwest, this burnt orange is the same color as, as the plastron. It's that, that pale yellow color, very distinct morphologies. Um, we can tell males from females by looking at the concavity of the plastron. You can tell by looking at the, um, at the size of the tail, males that are much bigger. You can also tell by the overall size. For this species, males do get larger than females, like snapping turtles, unlike painted turtles. Males also have a bigger head, wider head, chunkier head, larger bite force, probably to do with territoriality and male-male inter uh, male -male aggression during, um, uh, during breeding season. Here's a couple of other study animals. This is a male on the left. You can see his transmitter there. This is a female on the right. So these transmitters, this animal right here, I mentioned passed away on our property or on our study site. Um, this is a radio transmitter. I left it on the shell. Um, we're able to track the animals using these, these VHF radio transmitters um, by walking around with a, with a receiver and an antenna and we listen for the beeps. And as the beeps get louder, we know we're headed in the right direction. Um, it's a way of relocating uh, animals once they've been, once they've been radio tagged. So wood turtles um, are more common in the state than spotted turtles or Blanding's turtles, which are threatened and endangered respectively. Wood turtles are listed as a species of concern. It's also a priority one species of greatest conservation need in the state's most recent wildlife action plan, which is to say that the state puts a lot of time and effort into monitoring these populations. Maine appears to be a stronghold for this species, but they are declining pretty precipitously throughout much of their range. And they're listed in almost every US state and Canadian province in which they exist. And they're currently up for federal listing on the US Endangered Species Act. They're actually already listed in Canada and they're already listed on the international IUCN red list. So they tend not to be doing very well, which is why the state is so concerned about their population status here in, the, here in Maine. <clears throat> Much like snapping turtles, they start out at a very, very small size. This is a recent hatchling right here, probably not more than about three to four days old. You see they look a lot like other turtles. Uh, other turtle hatchlings, that is to say that they don't have a lot of color at that size. They really rely on crypsis. That is the ability to blend into the background. For protection. This little guy right here is obviously very, very young, probably emerged just a couple of days ago. How do we know that? Yes, that care uncle, that egg tooth, right? Very clear right there that he used to rip through that egg. It's a sharp little protrusion um, on the tip of the beak. So that's the wood turtle, Coptemis and Sculpta. And I should say that the scientific name 
um, uh, in sculpt though, right? The specific epithet has to do with the sculpted nature of each of those scoots, um, giving it the, the unique sort of pattern and texture on the carapace. Um, and the name wood doesn't refer to the habitat in which they live, although they do occasionally move into woodlands. Um, it has to do with their, uh, the annuli, those growth rings on each of those scoots, much like the rings of a tree. <clears throat> the next turtle that I want to tell you about, actually the next couple of turtles are a little bit different. So this is an Eastern box turtle. Just earlier this year, the state decided that this turtle should not be endangered. Not only that, but it gets now zero protection in the state. It used to be that they were so rare that they assumed that it was a, should be listed as endangered, right? Because there's so few of them. But the interesting thing is, is that Eastern box turtles are heavily collected for the pet trade. People tend to find them when they go on vacation down south, they stick them in their car, which is really sad, but true. Then they let them go when they get to Maine. So what the state biologists now believe is that Eastern box turtles were never native. And therefore it's a non-native species. And we have no evidence in fact, of any self-sustaining populations anywhere in the state Rather, we have these sort of seemingly random occurrences, mostly in Southern Maine, right? But throughout most of the state, these observations. So they concluded that they're probably the result of released pets or released animals that somebody collected for their south and just deposited on their vacation in Maine. So they're no longer protected by the state. Unlikely to see one because there are no self-sustaining populations, but they are still here and you might see them. It's quite a beautiful turtle. It is heavily collected. They get to be about this big, about seven inches or so, very high dome shell, a lot more like a tortoise that is a land dwelling turtle because they do tend to live on land, at least the ones, the Eastern box turtle, this particular subspecies, uh, they tend to be very, very terrestrial, right? very um, uh, land dwelling as opposed to aquatic. It is a beautiful turtle. Uh, and it's, um, uh, it's a shame that we have no self-sustaining populations anymore. So that's the Eastern box turtle, Terrapine Carolina. It's not actually a turtle of Maine, but you might see when it's possible. So I included it here for completeness sake. A similar story for the second turtle that I wanna talk about, or the last turtle that I wanna talk about, and that's the red-eared slider. Has anybody had a pet turtle in the past? Or maybe you do now. No, the most, oh, you do, okay. It, was it a red-eared slider, do you know? Maybe. Um, the most commonly kept turtle in captivity is the red-eared slider. It's a subspecies of, um, of a turtle called the pond slider, and there's many different subspecies. This particular one, for whatever reason, really, really caught on and became the most popular aquarium of sort of amateur turtle. They seem to be able to survive anything a kid could subject them to, which maybe that led to, to them being so popular. Um, it's probably why they're also on the Nature Conservancy's top 100 list of most invasive species in the world. They are now found on just about every continent that has turtles, which is to say every continent except Antarctica. Um, and there are self-sustaining wild populations in all of those different countries as well. They've also established themselves here in Maine. There's only, probably only a couple of populations in the wild that we don't really know. Nobody's really looking. Um, if you're interested in seeing one in the wild, well, you could go further south. They're extraordinarily common, down to like the uh, coastal plain of, of, um, of uh, like around the Gulf of Mexico. Um, or you could go to the Evergreen Cemetery in Portland because somebody deposited them there and now there's a population of them there. You'll have to sort of tease them apart because there's a lot of uh, painted turtles in those ponds at the Evergreen Cemetery as well. But there's also red-eared sliders. Red-eared sliders, uh, same family. Um, as the, the last ones I've been talking about. So this is a medium-sized turtle. It is quite a nice looking turtle. And sure enough, um, they have a red patch on the side of the head, right where that tympanic membrane is, hence the name red-eared slider. Um, and again, a very popular animal. Um, and anybody that sort of um, keeps turtles or knows very much about turtles is very, very familiar with red-eared sliders. And, um, and if you're really into reptiles, you might even dress your seven-year-old kid up as a red-eared slider for Halloween like I did. He's such a good sport about that. Fortunately, he liked turtles, so it was all good. 
Okay. So for the last part of the talk, I just wanted to uh, talk about a few things on, on what on what we could do um, as, as concerned citizens and turtle lovers in the state of Maine. So I have just a couple of suggestions and there are other ideas out there and absolutely follow up on them. Um, but one of them is if you see a turtle crossing the road, which I think pretty much everybody has, usually in the springtime when the females are getting ready to nest, they're moving around, they're crossing roads. Oftentimes they seek out gravel or sand or loose dirt someplace without vegetation. It sounds like I'm describing a roadside. I am because turtles will often nest on those roadsides, tracking them to roads, right? That's where we tend to see these uh, uh, turtle crossings and high turtle mortality. The two species that you're most commonly going to see on the crossing roads are our two most common species, right? Eastern snapping turtles and the painted turtles, although more than uh, their fair share get hit by um, more than their fair share of uh, uh, spotted turtles and wood turtles, and even Blanding's turtles uh, get hit by cars as well. So when you see a turtle crossing the road, if it's safe to do so, of course, you can shuttle that animal across. It's very easy with a painted turtle because it probably will never stick its head out of the shell, let alone bite you. Um, that's this guy right here. Um, if it's a snapping turtle, oftentimes they'll rear up and face you. Kind of like, I'm ready to take you on. You want to move me? <laughs> um, so they're, they're, they're very charismatic. Um, do proceed with caution, of course, uh, because snapping turtles really can pack a nasty bite. There's a few ways to safely handle larger individuals, um, including picking them up from the very back of the shell. This is not a snapping turtle, but you can pick them up like this. So if they're not too heavy, sometimes you can do that and sometimes slowly drag them across the road or even carry them across. That does work. Um, that's probably the, the easiest way to do it. Um, you can also, and I don't necessarily recommend this unless you have practice, but you can hook your fingers around this part of the turtle shell, right, and the back of the shell and pick them up like that. Maneuvering your hands there can be tricky. And if you're not sure what you're doing, probably not the best way to do it, but it is a safe way to handle a turtle. So if you see somebody else doing it and they know what they're doing, it is okay. Snapping turtles have extraordinarily long necks and they like to fling that neck back very quickly. It can be quite alarming. Um, so when you do carry an animal across the road, don't lift them more than about a foot or so, so we don't drop them and hook them. The other sort of rule of thumb to always pay attention to is move the turtle in the direction it's traveling, right? So if it's crossing the road to the left, move it to the left side, right? The left shoulder. That's important. Um, another sort of general thing, and I think everybody in here with, is 100% um, on board with this, but be mindful of what plastics you see around and what you discard into water bodies. If you see any sort of plastic rings, like from Gatorade bottles or pop bottles or the, the six the six pack, these things right here, whatever they're called, right? If you see those, just grab them, right? Because those are bad news for turtles. This animal right here, obviously, is not is not any better for it. This is a turtle that I suspect um, either had when it was really young, uh, like a small like a Gatorade uh, ring around it, or maybe one of these, um, and now it sort of has this, this permanent sort of problem. Yeah. I mean, stopping turtles all the time. When yeah. I do it, they get sick. You slap them the nose and go back and spread the plastic. Yeah, you know, I just... Don't really, risk your hands. Very dangerous. Yeah, um, as long as... You, if, if the animal is too big, you don't want to risk harming them. Um, some people will drag them by the tail or even pick them up by the tail and carry them. That's bad news. You know, you can dislocate their, um, their, their vertebrae and their tail doing that. If it's a really small one, you're probably okay. But if they're really small, you don't need to pick them up like that anyway. Yeah. But yeah, that that, that might be a good method for a, a smaller, yeah. medium-sized turtle. Yeah. Okay. Well, dragging the turtle with is that because of the plastron? Uh, the plastron should be uh, strong enough to endure that, especially if you're only going to drag it about you know, 10 feet or so. Yeah. And if it's not too big, uh, if it's a really big animal, I would recommend finding some other way to coax it off the street, um, if that's possible. What about, like, it comes that time I put a snow shovel in my car just in case. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that'll work as well. That, 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 that is like Um. I could see it working very well if you could coax the turtle onto the shovel. Yeah. 
I think that's a good problem. Yeah. Is it safe to, I've always picked them up between the front and the back. It's on the side. Is that okay to pick them up that way, Um, It is. So the thing that I would be careful of if doing that is their necks oh, yeah. could reach around. You know, but they also feed. <laughs> they do. <laughs> I'd rather get feet on them, okay, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So for snapping turtles, um, I, I would be careful um, positioning your hands too far up like this. I would do it more like this just to be safe. Um, but if you've had success with it, you're comfortable with it. Some, another way that you can carry them, and this is a more specialized way, you can pick them up by the back legs. So if the animal is facing away from you, basically come from behind, grab the back legs, and lift them up like this. But the problem is, of course, that animals hanging down here and you got to watch like your thighs and knees. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to hold them out of a little ways. Otherwise, that, you know, that beak will get you. So I, it's biologically safe, anatomically safe for the bird. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, you can pick them up up to an animal that's well, as big as you can carry. That's so probably up to about 25 pounds. Um, so a pretty big animal, picking them up by the back legs. But um, again, you do have to watch out for that long neck and short beak. Um, just a, a note that sure. I, I'd like to add mm -hmm. is that we have a camp on Hill River County of the Umbrella, and as you wear the snapper's blanket and some of the clothing on the same day, the teacher comes and goes there. We've noted oh. every year. Oh, interesting. Either side of the sculpture. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Interesting that it's it's so time to the solstice coincidentally. Uh, the, the nesting season for turtles, uh, for the turtles in Maine varies considerably by species, but most of them have a window of about two to five weeks. Um, and it's a lot of it's weather dependent. So last year they were nesting, like my wind turtles were nesting well into July, which was very rare, but it was so wet and flooded on uh, much of their areas. I think the females were just hanging on to those eggs longer. Um, we always watch for it because we know that's the day. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. It's a, uh, probably a, spect a spectacle to watch. Huh? Yeah. I have several questions. One is sure. it about 60 days for the just not for the egg. For the incubation period? The incubation. Yeah, it varies by species quite a lot. Um, but that that is in the ballpark. Uh, for, for most of the species. It also depends on the microhabitat where the eggs are laid. So in Maine, we're right at the northern uh, geographic distribution uh, for many of these species, like the Blanding's turtles, the musk turtles, the spotted turtles. Um, and so the single most important environmental factor limiting the geographic distribution to where it is, is the incubation period for eggs for those species. And um, we found the half dollar size snappers, sunny turtles, in the very beginning of the summer, and we wondered they must have overwintered. Is that possible? Um, there are species that will overwinter in the nest. The species that it's most common in, most well documented in, is the painted turtle. So some painted turtle hatchlings will will emerge in the fall. They'll find a water body and they'll overwinter in the water body. Other individuals do little whole clutches will stay in the nest underground. They'll hatch, but they'll stay by the eggs and then they'll emerge in the spring. For snappers, I've never heard of that. It's more likely that they hatched in the fall, moved to the water body, and what you saw was last year's young at that point in the summer. Oh, it wasn't in the water, but it was probably the previous, it would have had to have been the previous year's young. Yeah. Would you move the slide? Oh. Yes. Um, well, I, I actually I just have one. This is the, actually the last slide right here. So the, the last sort of um, um, suggestion I have for, for what you can do is if you see any of these turtles that were more uncommon, so those that were a species, species of special concern, like the wood turtle, threatened like the spotted turtle, endangered like the Blanding's turtle, you can report them to the state. They have a program called MARAP. It's the Maine Amphibian Reptile Monitoring Project. Um, you can do it all online. If you're an iNaturalist user, you have the iNaturalist app on your smartphone. 
You can also do it that way. Under projects, you can just select MARAP and the state will get will get the data from that. Or you can go right on the MDIFW, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife website, fill out the online form. They love it when you have photographs. If it's safe to snap a photo of it, you can upload that as confirmation of what you saw. Very short description, species, right? Whatever you can tell them, it's very, very fast. And that helps them track the distributions of these um, of the species that we're talking about. So reporting any unusual sightings, or if conversely, unusual animals in common places like Southern Maine, or if you're up in Northern Maine, where there's less data, fewer biologists roaming around the wild than there, um, you could report common species up there because it, that species may not have been reported in that particular township before. So that's also really important. Um, so with that, I'll end in this slide and, and answer any other questions. I've got two questions. Sure. I don't mind you criticizing this. You're doing the wrong thing. So well, the first thing is, let's see if you have an idea of what the blue box is. Okay. Um, I live on a hill near a small lake, a thousand feet from the lake. Every year, a painted turtle comes up, comes up the hill, insists on laying eggs in the same spot on the shoulder of the world. Unfortunately. I, I can see her because I can actually see that from my chair watching TV. Uh -huh. And I know when about to keep an eye and every year. And I've gone out and the reason I have tried to move her into the woods, uh, down the road, is the site. She insists on coming back. And I'm aware that painted turtles now nestlings can stay in the nest. So they have probably no chance of survival because people end up driving on the shoulder of the way. And so, yeah, but she insists that that's what we should have And I move her a short distance, move her up grade 50 feet, and she <laughs> like back this. I don't think she ever succeeds. It's Any suggestions? Bad. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a shoulder of a road. Yeah, public road. I can't do that. Um, so turtles, turtles are known for their phylopathy, right? They're they're they always yeah. return to the exact same places to nest. This is a feature of not just of painted turtles, but of others as well. Um, I mean, it it maybe it's a lot of work, but you could create a nesting area elsewhere, which is just a pile of sand or gravel. Thought of that. Okay, just up the hill a little bit. Because... Yep, make yeah. it about 10 inches deep. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe about the size of a table. I was criticized for by a knowledgeable person on the subject. Um, so I'm curious on your take on this. So I'm driving back from Lewiston and I'm getting a turn. There's a major strain there, I think maybe a large strain. There's two dead wood turtles in the of right the mm -hmm. And a third one alive, sitting in the shoulder front. Heavy traffic, girl wants to get across the road. I stop, I grab it, brought it back here, put it in the sandy rid of a drainage where I know there's wood turtles right half the time. And then, you know, I was told we did the wrong thing because that turtle's going to try to get back to my stream and turn it will cross roads and will likely get wrong. But that turtle would not have made it across the road, period. Yeah. It just wouldn't. There were two dead ones there already. So I'm just curious when you take that. And this was five, six years ago. So. Yeah, it, it, it's a yeah. tough one. Yeah. yeah. Would, would that turtle try to get back all the way down the turn in a different drainage? It's a, I also put it in a different drainage. It's possible. I, I don't know. So, so it's true. A lot of species do, do try to go back, right? Their ability yeah. to home is very good. For wood turtles, they do have good homing ability. But if it's an adult male, Adult males can also be wanderers. So it's possible that that turtle will settle down where you decided to put it. If the habitat was good and everything like you, you decided to put it. Yeah, that, that, that is possible. And, and I don't think there's any way to know for sure. In my experience working with wood turtles for 10 years, they really span the gamut of how big their home range is and how much they wander. Um, actually, my crew and I published a note a couple of years ago on what is thought to be the longest natural movement of a wood turtle. It was 40 kilometers. 40. 
okay. like four zero kilometers. This turtle was wandering across yeah. the mean. And so in, in situations like that, he had no pre, as far as we know, as far as we can tell, no pre-established like home range that, that he was occupying, unlike the vast majority of turtles. The males do tend to be more like wanderers than females. Um, it's it's hard to know if he's going to try to make it back or not. I mean, one thing you could do is take the animal to a wildlife rehabber and they would get in contact with state biologists and they would decide what to do. For turtles that um, like the wood turtle, spotted turtle, landing turtle, right? They're willing to give those turtles individual attention because they need it. If it's a snapping turtle or a painted turtle, I think that from a population perspective, that's less important. It's, it's a good question. I think, yeah. It hasn't happened again. I haven't. There are definitely hot spots of road mortality. I've seen those as well, and it's really sad. And you wish that there was more that could be done. What needs to be put in is a culvert or something like that, um, an animal friendly culvert so the turtles can disperse across. Yeah. yeah. I think we have a question from someone who was online. Oh, okay. First of all, they asked if someone in the audience has a question. Can you repeat the question? So that People online oh. know what the question is. Absolutely, yes. The question for this gentleman is the species of turtle that like slow moving water, moving water in general, what do they do in the winter time when things speed up? Yeah. So uh so the, the the question is what do turtles do in the winter if they live in water bodies that are moving? So like streams and rivers. Um so the turtles will hunker down in slow moving sections up under a bank, deep pools. Uh, around bends or areas like that where they carve out a deep pool. And if there's a log jam there, sometimes they'll climb under there, some protected place where the current won't sweep them away and they'll overwinter right there. So turtles have the amazing ability to slow their metabolism down. They don't technically hibernate, but they go dormant. And so that essentially means that they still can remain active and they might wake up during a warm spell in January, they might shift a few feet but they really don't move very much. So they're not true hibernators, but they do go dormant. They slow their heart rate way down. They, um, they do require oxygen because of course, you know, they're still living vertebrates. Um, so they, they, they practice um, other types of respiration, notably in species like painted turtles in like over in Vermont, we have um, uh, soft shell turtles, wood turtles. They use something called clo cloacal breathing which essentially means they breathe out of their butts, which is really cool, I think. <laughs> but um, yeah, they, they just position themselves and they use a thin membrane around their cloacal lining to respire. And that provides enough oxygen to get them through the winter. Yeah, and in moving water, the, the, um, the water is more oxygenated. So they're able to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, um, I had a similar experience with Someone else said, uh, this snapping turtle comes up to my front lawn and, you know, two or three years in a row, she the days in the same place, very difficult hours it takes. But so the last time they seen, after they, I, one of them was falling out of the, uh, or she had covered it up. And I so I, I moved some of the gravel and they were all down there in this, mm -hmm. you know, it was pretty deep and they, they couldn't seem to get out. I mean, they were like trying to climb up the sides of this hole, but um, so I put them in a plastic container and I took them to the wetlands, which was just across the road, and I let them go there. Is that so would they have just like walk up to the woods? And, did I do the right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, for those on Zoom, the question is. Um, if you find a turtle nest and the young can't seem to emerge from the nest on their own because of the environment is too deep or whatever, too much vegetation, is it okay to move them to a nearby wetland? Um, and the answer is uh, yes, as long as you're careful and you know what you're doing. If you think that they really can't get out on their own, it probably is okay to move them. Um, putting them in a bucket um, very gently one at a time shuttling them to a nearby wetland or even just immediately outside the nest and let them continue um, their movement back to whatever water body they want to go to on their own. That's that's perfectly fine too. Yeah, I, I do think that's okay. Now, I'll also say again though, if it is a species that is of concern to the state, um, they might want to handle that themselves. So technically we're not supposed to handle species that are listed, right? You have to have a rehab, you're not supposed to handle species that are listed. 
Um, and so it's not true for snapping turtles. It's not true for painted turtles, the ones you're most likely to find. Um, but it is best practice to call a wildlife rehabber or a state biologist and get some advice on what to do. If it's like a wood turtle, spotted turtle, blandings turtle, um, yeah, they'll, they'll, they, they may want to get involved. Yeah. yeah. Go back to the slides. This one? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So um, a number, of, uh, this is probably about five years ago or so, um, you may have seen memes or videos of um, of sea turtles with straws being removed from their nose. It's really straw. straw. It's a plastic drinking straw. So this is really what, it's a, a marine biologist, a graduate student at the time named Christine Figener. I think she was a grad student. Um, anyway, she she was working with her sea turtle study subjects and she saw something protruding from its nose. So her and her crew got out pliers and they pulled out this long drinking straw, right? It was a, a marine debris. And this sort of kicked off the anti-straw movement. Um, and so not discarding other types of plastic, like plastic straws. Um, okay, then like pull it out, like that. Um, I think there was a lot of blood involved, right? But they were biologists and as a team, so they, they felt comfortable doing that. I would be more cautious. I think I would take that animal to a wildlife rehabber and somebody someplace where a vet was present present in case something went wrong. Yeah. How long yeah. Did it take? <laughs> One more question and then I'll let, and then have people talk to Matt at the end. Sure. Uh, this is a really bizarre thing, but a very, very large snapping turtle was um, swimming where my two good friends, one, one used to be the head of Penny until eight years before telling them. And they thought when they saw this turtle, when they were swimming, it would shy away from them and instead it came toward them. And they started back paddling and it was coming faster. And they they literally um, back paddled up and jumped on this boulder that they had got in from. Uh -huh. And they said that it was huge shiny turtle and biggest one I've ever seen lunge and, and end up on the rock. Yeah, that yeah. Do you think it was <laughs> wanting to make her they said they never see. Yeah. So I'll just repeat I'll repeat the Question or comment? But, but, but the, the incidents for those on Zoom. So um basically uh, the snapping turtle was chasing somebody while they were paddling and even up onto the rock where they had escaped from this turtle. Um, so I have, I've seen similar things, not quite to that extent, but um, it's, what immediately comes to mind is this turtle was probably fed before in its past and it was after food and it associated people with food. Um, that, that can absolutely happen. I mean, people feed you know, junk food and whatever to, to turtles like they do other species. Um, so that that is a possibility, but not being familiar with this area, I don't know if that would have been a possibility there. Um, almost certainly, the turtle was not interested in mating, um, possibly in you know defending a territory or something like that. If it felt if it felt it was threatened, that's that's possible. Um, I, I I don't know. I'm usually skeptical of stories like that. I hear too many about snakes. Um, and living in the south, it's always a cottonmouth. There's always chase them, and they're always up a tree. I don't know why. Um, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't happen that way, right? Snakes don't chase people. It's probably trying to escape towards its its retreat burrow or something like that. But for the snapping turtle, I'm not sure. One more question on Zoom. Okay. Yes. If we know of a nesting site where eggs have been laid, are we permitted to do anything to deter predators, such as fencing or coverings, etc.? Yeah. So that's a good question. Are you able to? Um, to protect a nest. So um, what they're describing is absolutely good techniques for protecting a nest. My, my sort of generic suggestion is don't do anything. Um, contact state biologists or wildlife rehabbers. If they know what species it is and it's a common species, it might very well be okay to protect it. Um, if it's a declining species, state biologists might want to protect it. Um, we're getting to the point, I didn't talk a lot about conservation, but Turtles globally aren't doing well. Um, about 60% of all species are declining worldwide. And it's it's um, on the red, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature red list. It's kind of like the world's endangered species list. About 50% of all species um, are thought to be in, in some sort of substantial degree of decline. 
Um, so in general, we need to be very careful when dealing with turtle, turtle populations in the wild, not collecting them, not moving them, not harassing them. Um, they just, these, these um, uh, populations, species with very slow life histories, delayed uh, maturation until sexual reproduction, small clutch size, et cetera, um, really does lead to declines. So um, I know it's kind of a generic answer, but, but I would say um, contact a state biologist or wildlife rehabber figure out what species it is and if the, if the nest is deserving of that sort of attention. Because it, it could be that you end up doing more harm than, more harm than good. Um, those types of nest disclosures have to be monitored very carefully, you have to know what you're doing. Otherwise you could trap the young and actually really kill the clutch if you're not careful. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. <laughs> And if you would like to see any of the, the specimens, please come up and uh, and have a look. Some of them are quite fragile, but they're um, um but you're more than welcome to, to have a look. Uh, so I have snapping turtles, not as many things I've ever seen. Snapping turtles every year that come out of my pond and lay eggs. So and I see them on the drive, so I look at it because they like to lay them in the drive. <laughs> I, I live in San Antonio, and I have a swivel dog, so it's all so I can get. So I'll lay them in the yard. Yeah, I'll lay them in the yard and just pond them. But anyhow, I'm always, is there anything I should do? I mean, I can't, like, if they're in the driveway, drive in over the top of it, does it work? Should I park it out? And, in the yard, the same thing. Like I, I, I would avoid. 